Um, yeah, so this is a, a real nightmare, isn't it? The unhappy multifocal patient, just as Bobby said. And I'm going to talk about wavefront aberrometry. And, and I have no financial interest in Tracy. I've used the eye trace for now probably three and a half going on four years. Um, and, uh, you know, I think this is really an untold story. We all know the importance. I mean, we wouldn't dream of not evaluating the macula if someone was unhappy with their visual quality. And we use now spectral domain OCT to get 10 micron, you know, resolution of macular ultrastructural anatomy. And yet, on these cases, most of us know next to nothing about the optical quality of the cornea. So um, the eye trace combo has been my topographer because in addition to topography, I can get higher order aberrations. And of course, measuring of the entire eye doesn't really help you unless you can separately understand what are the aberrations coming from the lens and what are the ones coming from the cornea. And when this all first came out, you know, aberrations, that's one of those words that just kind of, you know, gives you a little <clears throat> in, you know, indigestion. It's like, can I really understand this? And um, I'll, I'll show you uh, basically that this uh, software really helps. In this case, an unhappy restore uh, patient. This woman is um, young and she's 10 years post myopic LASIK. The right eye is phacic, and this is now four months after restore 3 0, but that eye is not clear. Well, no wonder she's not happy. Her uncorrected acuity is 2100, okay? And she's got residual myopia and cylinder. And so the recommendation was made to do some more LASIK enhancement. Um, everything, including the macular OC, was normal. And, you know, usually what you want to do in these patients is either try glasses or try contact lens. Uh, and this was done because you kind of want them to know that, you know, this is what would happen if we tuned up your spherocylinder uh, residual refractive error, and then you can see the monthly focality. It was slightly sharper, but she was still unhappy enough to get a second opinion. Uh, and this is her lens, and there's actually a, a radial tear here. So, how many people with this restore here, and there's a radial tear here, how many people would enhance this with laser vision? Lazy. How many would take the lens out? I would say very few would, except when you do the eye trace. And again, for whatever reason, the quality of the vision here is not very good. And that's alarming, because LASIK, you know, will treat the sphere in the cylinder. So let's look at this. This is with a five millimeter pupil. This is the right eye, post LASIK. So we see some aberrations. And then the left eye, and again, I'm not an expert in reading topography, but this is not perfectly centered. But what I like about this is it really quantifies it. And it gives you, um, instead of just this gestalt of looking at it, say that topography looks a little funny. I mean, her trefoil and her coma is just off the map. And so uh, these are the aberrations of the total eye. Um, I ended up taking that lens out, and she was just, dramatically happier afterwards with a monofocal. So the lesson in her, this is before, uh, and this is with a monofocal, so she still has aberrations and they're still coming from the cornea. And you can do a compare map. This is with the multifocal and this is with the monofocal. And she still has aberrations and they're still from that cornea. Um, but there is a, a subjective improvement that um, was just dramatic in her case. And again, with the LASIK, you have not only the issue, post-LASIK eyes, of hitting emetropia uh, and trying to figure out the complicated astigmatism patterns, but then you have the issue of higher order aberrations uh, and whether they're going to match. What are the lessons of the cases that I've shown you? There are people running around right now with monofocal, but especially multifocal lenses that have high order aberrations, either in their cornea or coming from the IOL for some reason. The Snell and acuity is good, the exam is normal, and so everyone's going to tell them you have a normal eye. 
And the doctor's thinking, well, this is another fussy person, you know, this is the worst part about premium IOLs. And we offer them neuroadaptation, you'll get used to it, laser vision correction, or a YAG capsulotomy. And it really, I think, my three year, uh, almost four year experience with this has really taught me that A, I need to use this to screen all of my cataract patients because they're all, cons you know, cons uh, possibly premium IOL candidates, but it's absolutely essential with prior refractive surgery. And I'm really worried about IOL tilt when I use a multifocal now. So if I have a torn rexus, weak zonules, I gotta think twice about that. And I'm really concerned about a zonule dialysis or a sulcus because again, 2020 does not equal success if we have uh, issues with the uh, optical aberrations. And just really quickly, I mean, the, the challenges of being a refractive cataract surgeon needing so much more time to educate people and yet be efficient. Uh, and part of the excellence in the premium service is, I think, getting more information than we would for our regular cataract patients, whether it be an OCT of the macula or this type of optical evaluation. And so, you know, what we do, what I do, to try to be efficient as I explain premium IOLs via handout prior to the, uh, the, uh, the office visit, they get sent to the website, they fill out the Dell questionnaire, we try to initiate the education as soon as possible. Uh, this is the Dell questionnaire to which I've added, you know, where on this scale is your motivation to reduce your dependence on glasses, and over here I hate glasses. We have them fill this out. Um, but then what we do when patients come in is everybody who is there for a cataract evaluation, which is my practice, so it's everybody, we actually get the topography in the wavefront first. And it's very fast, it's, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a, it takes a few minutes, and we capture it, and we upload it, we don't print it out, we upload it to this um, uh, software called Forum from Zeiss, uh, and we do the biometry right away. And then we do the keratometry, the auto refractor, they see uh, my optometrist and get a refraction of tonometry and then dilate it. So what it means is we capture the topography before any drops have been put in, before they have a dry eye from staring a lot, and we have it on everybody. Um, so then when I walk into the room, all of the data that I think I'm going to need, ideally, is already captured. So after doing the exam and talking with the patient, I should be able to make a recommendation at that point and not have to say, afterwards, well, that multifocal lens that we spent 45 minutes talking about, now I've done uh, an eye trace and I don't think it's a good idea. That's what I'm trying to avoid. And um, the neat thing about Forum is, and, and uh, Topcon has a, a software sharing for, um, <clears throat> software, um, a file sharing software, is basically uh, you can put this on any exam room and it's stored and so uh, we don't uh, have to print it out necessarily, but I have the IOL master, so I know do, is this a, an unusual eye, an unusually short eye. Uh, we can show the, uh, the white to white, the pupil size. Uh, you can display the macula, and I can look at my um, eye trace combo printout. So here's someone that really wants a multifocal. He's got a little cylinder in the right eye. That's something I formerly probably would have just done an LRI for. And there's this topography. And is that okay? That's the question. And for someone who hasn't been doing LASIK their whole career, you know, a lot of us, you know, nobody has a normal topography when they're 70. They don't look like the 30-year-old topographies. Well, is that okay or not? And so you do the, uh, you look at the wavefront. That's the left eye. That looks pretty good. Again, these aberrations, as Bobby said, that's from the cataract, so you can learn those, but look at all the aberrations here, and I see that and I go, there's no way I want to put a multifocal there, okay? And that means, in this case, toric IOL, and I think Kevin's going to talk about that, but one of the nice things here, here's the SIM-K, and the SIM-K means you're getting the K readings just from that ring. And then this K up here is the refractive K, and that's coming from the best fit for the entire area within here. And that's what I use for my uh, toric IOL. 
So for, we still have paper charts in my office. So we don't print this out unless they become a refractive cataract patient, meaning they're getting a premium IOL, an astigmatic keratinary. Then we print it out. I bring it to the OR. Um, uh, otherwise, it's just sitting on the server. Uh, but I do this for efficiency. Uh, we use the same system to show uh, patient education and so forth. Um, but anyway, so that has sort of been my solution to the uh, conundrum of, you know, doing this efficiently and uh, treating everyone as a potential uh, refractive patient.